Um, the last section, we're going to talk about some management factors. Um, so um, the two most important things are pasture and pasture management. So please come back on Thursday um, for some great information on pasture management um, as it relates to our small ruminant species. Um, and then I'm just going to touch briefly on biosecurity because it's, I think it's something that um, producers sometimes forget. So um, important to, to take note of that. All right, so we're just going to go through a few slides for parasite management as, or excuse me, pasture management as it relates to parasites. So um, the, the two biggest sources of pasture contamination, um, and remember, I don't think I've said this, but about 80% of the worms are in the, in the environment. So about 20% in the animals, and then 80% in the pasture or environment. Um, and so what are the two biggest sources of pasture contamination? Um, adult females at spring turnout, and then um, kids or lambs by mid to late grazing season. So those are the two biggest sources um, that we want to think about monitoring pretty, pretty heavily. So we also want to capitalize kind of on what we know or what we talked about um, in the first couple of slides about the larvae on pasture. So um, they don't like to be dry. So let's dry them out so we can break up that fecal pellet. Um, we can modify our grazing based on temperature and humidity. So again, we might not want to graze or turn our animals out onto pasture in the early morning because we have that dew in the grass, um, which is helping those, those larvae kind of climb up the um, the, uh, the stalks of the, the grass. Um, we don't want to graze below two inches. So the picture on the right hand side there shows that um, the majority of the larvae don't climb above two inches. So if, we're, um, if we are fortunate and we have goats that like to browse, um, we can avoid that by letting them um, strip bark. Um, or uh, we just don't graze below that two inches. And then avoiding wet areas. So this is also important for flukes. Um, if there are known wet areas in a pasture, just fence them off, put some flexing net up and don't let the animals um, into, that, into that space. And then um, I think Brenda, I hope Brenda uh, will we'll touch on this on Thursday, um, but rotational grazing. So this is something that can help. It's been documented to help. Um, there was a recent study that with cattle um, that showed no effect um, of reducing worm burden, um, but it's something that we talk about a lot is, and I think that, um, that there's some, some real advantages for, for other reasons, um, but that's something to think about. The only thing we want to consider is we don't want to graze, we don't want to rotate with like sheep and goats because they will carry the same parasites um, and then we're just back in kind of the same boat that we were before. And then what about pasture rotation? So um, this is really, really tricky when it comes um, to, to parasites um, because these parasites can overwinter, they can live in animals. So, so knowing when a pasture is, is quote unquote safe is nearly impossible unless that pasture has been rested with no animals on it for years. Um, and so as it relates to homunculus, um, unless the frequency of rotation is like less than seven days um, and in, in the summertime, the eggs that are deposited um, will likely be hatched upon return to that pasture. And remember that those L3 um, with that really protective cuticle can live a really long time. So what if we're, we have to rotate our pastures? Um, so there are a couple, couple things to keep in mind. So we can rotate our young animals always ahead of our adults. Remember our youngsters don't have the immunity. They're smaller in body size. So they have less like blood available for our, uh, our homunculus to suck. Um, we can use adults uh, in our heavily contaminated pastures. Um, we could keep our nursing animals. So again, the, the nursing animals with the little lambs and the little kids, we want to keep those out of those um, really contaminated pastures and then lower stocking densities. Um, so one rule of thumb is less than six to eight goats per acre. Um, and there are, there are others who say less than that. Um, so lower stocking densities can also help. And then um, some, another thing to think about is um, if we are going to deworm, when do we move those animals into a new pasture? And um, this is the current recommendation for doing that. So it's called the delay dose and move strategy. And so what we do is we have our, um, our sheep or our goats in our contaminated pasture. 
we want, we, there's nothing really we can do to mitigate the, the larvae that are in the pasture. It's not like we can spray them. We can't do anything there. So we want to reduce the parasite burden in the animals. So we treat them. Then we wait a few days and then we move them to a safe pasture. And what that does is it um, allows those, those sheep to pick up um, a few worms that they're going to put in that, they're, they're gonna lay eggs in that new pasture, but it's gonna reduce the amount um, of resistant worms that we're going to have. And what we really want, remember, we want resistant worms to basically breed with non-resistant worms um, so that we dilute that population of resistant worms. So this is the current, um, uh, recommendation is that we, we treat, we delay moving for a few days, um, and then we move them to that safe pasture. So another thing that we can do is, and I, I'm sure Brenda's going to talk about this, we can just make some hay. So if we have a pasture that's really contaminated, we can not graze it that summer, or we can make hay, and that should reduce um, or eliminate the number of, of larvae that are on that pasture. The other thing that we can do, and this is sometimes what we recommend to, to people who um, are just having terrible problems with parasites, is just dry lot them. So um, this is a, a strategy that um, some people use with their market animals um, or their, their ewe lambs um, or their, their young kids, their replacement kids, um, their doe lanes, to keep them from getting, that, getting contaminated um, out on pasture. Um, to put them in a dry lot setting. And um, the, the most important thing here is that we consider um, where those animals are eating to make sure that they're not eating on the ground. Because remember, um, we talked about this at the very beginning, that the, there still can be um, transmission um, of, of worms. These animals still could have um, parasites on board. Uh, so if we keep them in this very dry environment and we feed them, we prevent manure from being in the feed, um, keep them from eating on the ground, um, we should be able to reduce um, our parasite burden. Okay, and then um, the last thing we'll, we'll just touch base on um, is biosecurity. And so this is for um, our transient animals or our purchased animals. And I have pictures of rams and bucks here because it's often um, what we're purchasing. We're purchasing um, our potentially seed stock um, or, or bucks for breeding. Um, and so we want to mitigate other infectious disease too. Um, so we might test for CAE, we might test for OPP, um, we might um, test for yonis. So in addition to that, we want to think about parasites. Um, and so sometimes we know the status of the, the herd that the animals are coming from. Oftentimes that's not possible um, or we just don't have the information. And so a good rule of thumb is to, to isolate all new additions to the barn um, in a dry lot setting for at least 14 days. And so this will give enough time if the animals are going to break with respiratory disease, um, if they're going to break with foot rot, those kind of things that you really don't want on your farm or transmit it to your herd. Um, that will, that 14 days is kind of the minimum that we would want those animals to be um, isolated. And then um, this is the time. So we didn't talk about combination dewormer therapy intentionally because I didn't want to confuse you, but um, this would be a time when you would potentially do that. So um, what we would want is for those animals to have a 100% fecal egg count reduction. So we took a fecal from them, we dewormed them, um, and we only got a 90% reduction. That would not be good enough. We want those animals to be clean before they go and, and go be integrated into your herd. Um, so we would want that fecal egg count reduction to be near um, or 100% before those animals are integrated. Okay, so now for the summary. Um, so for factors that increase worm burden. So, and this is, this is temperatures greater than 50 degrees. So pretty much in Minnesota now, um, every day, um, if we have more than two inches of rain a month, and um, certainly last year, we had quite a bit of rain um, in, in this area of the country. Um, if we're spending a long time on the same pasture, if we're grazing close to the ground, remember those larvae can only get up two inches. And so that picture on the right are some uh, sheep 
that are grazing there in, I think it was November that we had the students out to that farm. Um, and so there's really nothing there. Those sheep are grazing very close to the ground. Um, so that um, is a potential if it were summertime um, for some good transmission there. Um, if animals are stressed, we have high stocking rates. Um, and then if we're not using the anthelminic um, appropriately. And then what about factors that decrease worm burden? Um, so again, proper pasture management. So tune in Thursday for that. Um, monitoring your, your sheep and goats using um, strategic fecal egg counts, matcha scoring, um, targeted selective therapy. So only treating those either animals at the group level or preferably at the individual level um, that really need and will benefit from that treatment. Um, harder to do in small flocks and herds, but certainly culling um, is an important component to all of this. Um, and one rule of thumb is that animals um, that need three doses more than the flock average, so say um, that your flock average, you treat everyone two times a year. If you have animals that you treat five times in a year, those are probably animals um, that either don't develop great immunity um, or they just have really um, heavy burdens. Maybe they have something else going on. Maybe they're, they have Yomi's disease, something else that is causing some immunosuppression. Um, so that might be an animal uh, that we would, we would want to call and send on down the road. Um, and then certainly monitoring and record keeping. So body weights, body condition scores, um, keeping track of who you worm and when, um, that can all be really useful, um, especially as you look back and say, okay, how am I gonna plan for this year knowing what happened last year? Another thing to keep track of um, is pasture rotations um, and you know how much time you're, you're spending on those pastures and those kind of things too. Record keeping um, is really important. And then um, this is just to, uh, these are some really lucky goats uh, that live on a farm in central New York. And this is to, to, for me to remind you um, that sometimes we don't need to deworm at all. And so um, these goats live in this little, little pen. Um, and I don't know if you can see, but in the back there, there's some flexi net and they have like a 20 acre pasture. And there's that flexing that moves every three to four to five days. Um, and so these animals, their risk is really, really low. There's three animals on, in this herd. Um, they're moving a lot through that pasture that has never had animals on it before. Um, certainly they have risk of other things, potentially deer worm, um, there's coyotes, so there's predation challenge, um, but um, we shouldn't be turn. We should be do turning to our management, um, looking at our animals before we start throwing dewormers at them, because it only just um, increases the risk of anthelmintic resistance. And not deworming animals is okay. We don't need to deworm everything. So, and now I'll just um, finish with some resources. So again, wormx.info, great website. I encourage you all to go there. Um, another website that is similar but has some, some different information on it because it's Australian um, is Worm Boss. Um, certainly the, the Maryland Small Ruminant Extension um, has a great Facebook page, so I encourage you to follow them. They have lots of educational opportunities. Um, and then there's also the Maryland Small Ruminant page, um, which has a lot of great information on it. Um, and then if you're specifically interested in, um, in deer worm or brain worm, P. tenuous, um, I encourage you to go um, get some more information at, at the, the Cornell deer worm page. And then um, with that, uh, we're, we're finished. Um, so please don't hesitate to email me with questions. Um, I, I love to talk about sheep and goat parasites. It's um, one of the the things that um, we, we really harp on our students um, and we, we think is one of the most important things that, that we need to be concerned about um, as veterinarians for our small ruminants. Um, I just want to remind you, uh, please come and join us on, uh, on Thursday um, for a great presentation um, from Brenda talking about um, pasture management. And thank you. And I guess I hope um, we've had some great discussions in the chat. Um, happy to field any questions now um, as we as we finish up. Thanks, Whitney. Yeah, um, a couple of questions that are in the chat right now is. What has research said about the recent approach to dosing with all three classes of dewormers simultaneously? This presumably kills as large a percentage of the worms as possible. There's a little bit more 
verbiage with that, but just really wondering, is, is this what research shows actually happens? Yes. So, so the reason I, so I, I, per, I intentionally did not talk about common, like what, what we call combination therapy, um, because I think that there's a big risk of screwing it up. Um, so when we think about that, um, we typically do that when we have um, resistance. So um, it's really important to know first um, what dewormers work on your herd or flock because you don't, if you have a, a like say fenbendazole, which is classically um, uh, worms develop resistance to, um, might only be 40% effective. Um, so we probably won't want to use a white wormer in, in your herd or flock if we're using combination therapy. Um, and so the idea there um, is say we have two dewormers um, and one is, um, they're both 80% effective. So we want our dewormers to be 95% effective. So if we're using um, two dewormers in combination, the first one is gonna hit 80% of the worms, right? The second one, so then we have 20% of worms left. The second wormer is going to hit um, another 80%. So when we add that together, we're going to get 96% of the worms in that individual animal. So um, the, the risks are if you're doing that at the whole herd level, um, you're going to rapidly develop resistance and lose the effectiveness of your dewormers. Um, there's also some, some things to consider um, with um, with combination therapy, we want to give both or th all three at the same time. We don't want to give dewormer one Monday, dewormer two Wednesday, and dewormer three Friday. They all go into the animal at the same time. Again, really, really important to have accurate body weights. Um, so yes, it does work. Um, if you have a, um, a, a resistance problem in your herd or flock, um, it's something you should talk with your veterinarian about um, to develop a plan. Um, it's not something that you should just start doing, especially at the whole herd or flock level, because then you're just going to run out of all options. Thanks. Thanks. That's a good answer. I did launch the poll here just uh, as we have some people dropping off. So please be sure to fill out the poll before you hop off for the evening and make sure to join us on Thursday at 630 again. And Whitney, another question is, why is it not recommended for nursing animals to move to pasture in the spring? Isn't their immunity stronger because they're getting mom's milk at the same time? Seems like you would want to wean on pasture rather than before to not cause additional stress. Okay, so, so two kind of separate issues there. So um, what we're worried about when we're talking about weaning and putting animals on pasture is we're worried about the contamination that those animals are going to face. So if we're, if we're talking about um, weaning and putting those animals, putting those weaned critters um, on a clean pasture that we know is clean, that no adult has been on for the past year, um, that is fine. What we don't wanna do is put those animals um, either follow follow them, um, put them together with mom on a pasture because those those remember we the that's a really good time for lots of fecal egg sh um, shedding to happen, um, and so those animals those those young animals can become infected really quickly. We don't really get a lot of um, immunity to gastrointestinal parasites in the colostrum, um, so so that's not typically the immunity is developed. Um, when animals start seeing the worms and start start developing their uh, immune function, which is why um, in sheep, for example, um, we see resistance or immunity happening over the course of the grazing season rather than them coming on the pasture with immunity. They have to have that pressure of infection um, to develop that immunity. So it's mostly about putting young animals that have never seen a parasite on a heavily infected field. Thank you. How beneficial is feeding the herd COB? I'm not sure what they mean by COB. Maybe did they mean copper wire? Copper wire? Or do you know anything what COB might be? COB. Um, Rachel, would you like to like resubmit that question and we'll come back to that one? 
Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Yeah. Um, the next question would be, are pumpkins effective to assist with worm prevention? Yeah, I don't know. So I think the, well, the way that I'll answer that, so there is some data on pumpkin seeds uh, that does nothing. There's no data to support that that reduces worm burden. Certainly can be nutritious um, for, for the animals, but um, is not going to reduce your worm burden. And I guess I would probably say the same thing about pumpkins. I don't, I don't know. I haven't seen a study that, that looks at pumpkins um, specifically. Um, certainly if you're feeding it in, away, like in a, in a dry lot setting away from pasture, that can be effective. Um, but I'm not sure that it would do anything um, to, to the, um, the adult worms in an animal. Not, not sure about that, but I, I, I doubt it. And then the next one would be, what triggers the larvae to come out of hyper, hyperbiosis? Specifically, is that the change in outdoor temperature, length of daylight, hormones? How does this apply to males versus female sheep? And so on. That's a, that's a great question. So worms are so smart and we don't have all the answers, but what seems to trigger, so some people think that, um, that melatonin or changes in daylight might have something to do with it. But I think the big thing um, is that drop in immunity um, at parturition, so for females. So this would be, you know, there are some studies that show that um, there's a study done in sheep where um, they looked at like fecal egg counts like every day for two months. Um, and they found that at 20 days post lambing, that's when the fecal egg counts went way up. Um, and so, so what that means is if it's taking three weeks for those adults to mature um, and create eggs, it means that right around that time of, of lambing is when those worms were emerging. And um, so, so daylight probably has something to do with it. Um, potentially um, the temperature um, and certainly um, we, we often, that's a good question about males, um, we often think about it in the context of females of our, of our um, and I always tell my students, don't forget about the bucks, don't forget about the, the rams, um, but I, I think that they can overwinter the same way. Um, it's it's um, probably the, the emergence has to do more with other things um, rather than a, a dip in immunity. Um, but they still, they can overwinter in adults and they can, they, they come out um, in, in the springtime. Good answer. Okay, what does research say about how long you have to leave a pasture ungrazed before it is clean or that the parasite worms are gone? Uh, I think I'm, I'm gonna wait, I'm gonna say hold tight until, until till Thursday and Brenda will address that. I think that um, there's not a lot of good evidence to, uh, to give us like a specific day right. or a specific time um, because it depends a lot on temperature, it depends a lot on freezing, um, and it depends on the worm too. Um, so there's a lot of factors. Um, and so maybe, maybe um, Brenda will give you more insight to that on Thursday. And there was some clarification on what COB is. That's corn, oats, and barley. So how much is too much of that mix? And uh, just some elaboration that that mix of corn, corn, oats, and barley can come with or without molasses. And many people often mix it with alfalfa pellets. Okay, and the, the question is, how does... Uh, how beneficial is feeding the herd this mix of corn, oats, and barley? Are there any nutritionists here? <laughs> um, uh, uh, as it relates to worms, um, I'm, I'm not sure as it relates to like an energy source for your flock, um, probably a pretty good source. I, I'm, Travis, do you want to jump on about that? Yeah, I think that is a fine, um, you know, mix and that you can be able to, to work with, but I don't know that it particularly relates to our uh, discussion on parasites. But whenever you're balancing a ration, uh, those are those are things that can be beneficial for your sheep and or goats. Thanks, Travis. 
All right, next question. Diomaceous earth is not effective as an internal treatment, but is there any evidence of killing the worms parasites by treating a pasture by spreading it? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, I feel like I've read, so I would encourage you to go to wormx.info and look that information up because there's some good information on diatomaceous earth. And I think there's some information on there um, about pasture. I, I feel like I remember reading it is not effective um, at reducing pasture larval burden. Um, but I, I would encourage you to go to that website and, and do some digging because there's some, there's some really, there's some good studies in there um, on diatomaceous earth. Okay. We've, this is Colleen Carlson, um, University of Minnesota Extension. Diamantaceous earth is used a lot of times for um, mites in poultry because they do the dust bath and they scratch the, the, the birds, do the dust bath and the diamantaceous earth gets up on their bodies and then it scratches those larvae open and then when they're exposed to the air, um, they die. So um, I haven't seen diamantaceous earth used in goats or for pasture, but is, is used a lot for poultry. Cool, thanks, Colleen. Okay, does it help to dry lot the ewes and newborn lambs for a few weeks to a month before putting them on pasture? This is without deworming the ewes, except for the ones that have high FAMACHA scores or are otherwise stressed. I'm just gonna nod my head because yes. So, so what we're trying, what, the, the reason for that is that we prevent um, contaminating those pastures with like the first pass um, of, of worms that are coming out of those animals um, due to that hypobiosis. So yes, that will prevent those young critters um, of getting those high burdens. So yes, there, there are always advantages to dry lotting and selective targeted treatment um, before putting animals on pasture. Okay. What would be the main reason for diarrhea in a two-month-old kid? Is it too young to worm? We did put them out on pasture with mama for a few hours, several days. That sounds like a treatment question. Um, so, so always in young animals, I think of coccidia first. Um, so so I, I, would, I would work with your veterinarian um, or talk to your veterinarian um, about that specific animal. Um, and, and develop a, a treatment plan for it. I mean, it, it's possible that it's due to, to gastrointestinal parasites, but it's unlikely. It's probably something else going on. Quick question um, relative to testing, uh, Dr. Knauer. Uh, so we know that testing can be somewhere between $15 to $25, um, but people want to make improvements on individual animals. Um, is there anything that you particularly expect? Because if we have a large group, uh, $25 an animal is not a feasible option relative to how we can move forward. Yeah, so that's a good question. So, so one thing that we can do um, is we can pull samples. So you can take, if you want to get an idea of what the fecal egg counts are, and not use no fecal egg counts in targeted selective therapy. Um, we can take fecals from a representative proportion of the herd or flock um, and then run them all together. The, the risk in doing, so that saves some, some money. Um, the risk in doing that is if you have some animals that have 2,000 eggs per gram and some animals that have 50 eggs per gram, it's going to, you're going to, the law of averages, you're going to dilute that out. So you, you might not um, consider the problem as severe as, as it is in, in some individuals. Um, the other thing that you can do is, um, and sometimes this is what we, we do um, with our students, is that we, we only take fecals. So we from match score and we only take fecals from animals that are um, threes, fours, and threes maybe. So threes or fours or five. Certainly we would want to deworm those animals anyway. Um, my personal bias is that um, I think fecal egg counts can be sort of useful, but I think look, like practically, I think looking at the animal and FAMACHA scoring is in my mind more useful um, than, than a fecal egg count, to be honest. 
Thanks, Whitney. Uh, another question. If using the copper bolus, would feeding molybdenum be beneficial if concerned about copper poisoning due to known copper amounts in feed sources? Or would molybdenum cancel out the deworming benefits? That's a good question. So, so the idea there is so molybdenum um, inhibits copper availability. Uh, and so we actually reduce the absorption. I think I would, I would have a lot of caution there um, in, in trying to balance out the, the administered copper um, because if you could screw up the, the levels in your ration and then cause copper deficiency, which is like something that we never see um, or that we are actually seeing more and more because of that, that molybdenum and copper um, interaction. So I, I guess I would say that um, it's probably more important to just have caution and, you know, do the recommended um, uh, um, interval between bolusing animals um, and pay attention to the copper levels. I mean, I, I'm, I'm of the opinion that we should be feeding sheep and goats sheep mineral um, because I think like we see copper toxicity in goats too. I know we talk about um, goats being less susceptible or sheep being more susceptible, um, but I, I don't think I would probably mess around with my, with my mineral. I think I would just have caution and use the copper boluses um, judiciously. Um, you know, certainly in market animals, that's probably fine, but if you're going to use it in replacements, um, really, really pay attention to the interval and make sure that um, you're not giving them too frequently. Uh, thank you. Uh, what, so we'll just keep rolling with questions here. What are the most common parasites or diseases that we have in our region of, well, this particular person is asking in the Fargo-Moorhead region. So Travis, you probably know up there a bit too. Yeah, go ahead, Travis. Well, I would be correct that uh, first off, it's homunculus catortis. Um, I mean, that's that's the the game breaker, the deal breaker, and like uh, Dr. Knauer said, I mean, an easy way to at least identify. And you don't know unless you obviously get some of that fecal egg count and then even go a little bit farther. Um, but at least that's that's the big one. That's the one that hurts us the most, and so uh, that can be the the largest challenge. But at least we can try to make progress um, on that one. And obviously the, as was previously stated, the FAMACHA scoring can help us get there as quick as anything, at, at least visually. Yeah, so, so I didn't say this, but for the participants who are still with us, um, the reason homunculus is such a big pain in the butt is because it, the females are really, really prolific. So one female can lay like 10,000 eggs a day or something, I, I might be, that might be too many, but it, they make a lot of eggs. So we've got a lot of contamination. And um, when it's really hot outside, they, the, they, the larvae mature really fast. Um, so if we're in some of those worms, we're talking like a six week window from the time the, feed, the, the, um, the worm is on the pasture to the time the, the, that larva is in another pasture. So it's usually a six week window. With homongous, it can be down to three weeks. So um, it's just a really uh, challenging worm. Um, and I think uh, in, in the upper Midwest, um, people have been kind of a little more laissez-faire about parasite control, thinking that our, our cold winters um, nip it in the bud, but that's not true with how these these worms have adapted. Um, so, so I, I would agree that that homunculus is the one that we we fight the the most fiercely. Whitney, um, so is it the day length or the date on which the ewe gives birth that triggers the end of hyperbiosis? How long does the surge peak in egg laying last? If it's brief, could I dry lot my ewes and lambs starting at 28 days from partrition when the peak occurs, say for one month, and have most of the eggs end up in the dry lot? Yeah, I guess, I guess potentially. 
Um, I mean, so, so that 28 days, that's quoted from one study and like one species of sheep. So I, I don't know that we have a lot of good information as to like the variation in how long um, after parturition or that immune suppression that those, um, those eggs peak. Um, but certainly again, um, dry lotting animals um, and either treating them and then moving them out to pasture or just delaying moving them out to pasture um, can really help with pasture burden. Okay, so how long do the worms live inside a sheep and then how long, so we talked about the 28 days. How, many, how long do we have to dry lot an animal before the worms are gone? Four to six months. So the worms, the adult worms can stick around for quite a long time. So um, again, that's why deworming and killing those worms is, is an, an important component. Um, but if a natural infection, so that, that number is homonchus. So those homonchus adults can live in the sheep and be sucking blood and, and contaminating, um, making eggs for, for four to six months. Can you use horse wormer for goats? No. no. Hmm. All right, and what causes hair loss uh, and rubbing? Could that be worms? So hair loss and rubbing, I think of lice before all else. So especially at this time of year in the springtime, if you get goats with little bits of um, cashmere on the end of their horn tips, you get like vertical lines of rubbing. Um, I, I think about either sucking or biting lice. So um, that's uh, in that, the way that you, you yourself um, can diagnose that. You can um, look at the animal. Um, most of the times those, those lice are, are visible to the, the naked eye. Um, so the, the place that they like to hang out on animals is kind of a, around um, the tail head. So you part the, the wool, you part the hair of the goat, um, and you, you can usually kind of gives you the heebie-jeebies, but you can kind of see them crawling around. Um, so that's, I, I would be looking for external parasites, um, first and foremost. Uh, Whitney, another question here about biosecurity. Can you recommend a protocol for bringing new sheep to your farm? Obviously isolation for three weeks, but are there any other practices you recommend? Sure, so I, I um, it depends on what uh, class of animal they are, um, but certainly, um, foot trimming, so um, giving them, picking up all their feet, trimming their feet, that will alert you as to whether or not there are hoof problems or potentially hoof rot um, that you potentially are bringing into your, your herd. Um, I think doing um, deworming, so doing a fecal egg count reduction test, and this is a time when um, we might consider using combination dewormers, um, so using two or three dewormer classes in combination. Um, and it's also a great time if you're, if you're CAE free or OPP free, um, if you're a Yoni's free herd, um, testing, you know, doing some, some diagnostic testing at that time is, is really good because um, the, the last thing you want to do um, is, is bring in some of those chronic infectious diseases into your herd. Um, so, you know, and also, you know, just simple things like putting your hands on the animals, so body condition scoring them, um, uh, you know, checking... Uh, I was going to say checking their teeth, but eh, if they're, if they're youngish animals, um, they're probably fine. Um, you know, it'll be also a time, depending on time of year, um, where you might, if they're, if they're males, um, you might do a breeding soundness exam. Um, but certainly doing things like the simple things like trimming their feet, um, deworming them, um, and keeping them, keeping them away from your, your flock or herd um, for those 14, 21, 28 days. I know sometimes it can be challenging because you just don't have um, the space um, in your in your um, barn or on your on your operation to do it. But I think it's it's really important to keep um, your home flock safe. All right. Um, another one is: Am I correct that if no one uses only if or if one uses, excuse me, if one uses only FAMACHA and body condition scores to decide which animals to deworm and do not do the FECO, the FECs, you will not identify animals that are resilient versus resistant. 
For example, they're not anemic, but are carrying a high worm burden and shedding lots of eggs. Yep, that's correct. So that, that would be a good opportunity to use your fecal egg counts. And, and th there's a lot of talk about this resistant versus resilient. Um, we, we actually probably don't want resilient animals in our herds and flocks. So resilient is, so a resistant animal is an animal that develops immunity, right? And so they don't carry a heavy worm burden. A resilient animal is an animal that has a heavy worm burden, but looks fine. And that is like, again, that typhoid Mary who's spreading all of her, her eggs all over the farm. Um, so that's probably an animal that we, we don't want. So we probably, we want resistant animals, genetic resistance. We don't necessarily want resilient animals um, because they're, they're a burden um, for the rest of the herd or flock, unless we have all resilient animals. That would be great. Um, but I'm not sure that those, those herds and flocks exist, at least not yet. Okay, thank you. And that's about using a poron for external parasites on everyone and coinciding resistance to internal parasites? Yeah, so that's a good point. So, um, so, so the first, so when we're talking about external parasites, the, the important thing to consider is we need to know what we're treating um, because we treat different, so if we're talking about lice, we treat lice differently depending on what kind of lice they are. Um, so we have lice that suck blood and we have lice that um, chew and like eat dead skin. The, the lice that eat dead skin, porons, permethrin, dust, maybe diatomaceous earth, um, the, the, but the dusts are the thing that will kill that. That will not kill sucking lice. In that case, um, we have to use an injectable product because we, if, if we just um, cover the thing, if we cover the animal um, with, with dust and, and they, the, the, the sucking lice won't, um, they won't die because they need to actually um, ingest the, the um, anthelminic through the blood of the animal. Um, it's a risk. So um, and, and, an injectable um, does work uh, to kill gastrointestinal nematodes. It's just that it's a, it's a bigger risk um, for, for resistance. So again, we want to know if we're treating lice, we want to know what kind of lice we're treating um, and then make that choice um, uh, appropriately. And I mean, often we're only treating, um, you know, once, once a year um, in two, usually two treatments. Uh, for, for lice. So, um, you know, we might be, be generating some resistance with, um, with our gastrointestinal um, parasites, but, um, you know, I, I wouldn't not treat an animal for lice um, in, in hopes that I wasn't creating anthelminic resistance. Hey Whitney, going along with that pour on question, I oftentimes hear producers um, talking about or suggesting to each other to use a pour on internally. I'm not sure why they would, but could you please speak on that? I could. Yeah, don't do that, please. Um, so we, what they're probably talking about um, is using moxidectin or using cydectin. Um, cow pour on? Right. Probably. That's probably what they're talking about. And um, in sheep and goats, there's really no reason to do that because we have um, cytectin that is labeled um, for sheep um, to go orally. So, so there are products available and I would say that um, using, it's, it's a big risk. If, if you're using something else that you're going, that is supposed to be a pour on, um, that you're using orally, that's a big risk for toxicity. Um, and we have, we have good products available. Um, so I would stick to those products that are labeled for sheep and goats that are supposed to go orally. Thank you. And here's a specific question from a, uh, an attendee here. I just had a fecal with only one goat carrying only a two total count of homunculus, EPG. Do you recommend worming this goat, worming the flock? Mm, so I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not going to make treatment recommendations um, because I don't have a veterinary client patient relationship. Um, I would say talk talk to your veterinarian um, about the, those results um, and and establish a plan with them. Thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Knauer? 
All right. Well, thanks again, Dr. Whitney, and I thank you all for joining us this evening. We appreciate it, and we hope you can join us on Thursday, where Brenda Postels will talk about pasture management. We had lots of teasers about it tonight, so I hope you can join us then. Mm -hmm.